Let us pray. Our understanding of your word comes from you, O oh God. Open our ears and our minds and our hearts to hear what you would have to say to us. Help us upon hearing to understand and upon understanding to act in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Reading from the 18th chapter of the Gospel according to John, this is in the midst of the arrest and trial of Jesus. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king? For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is truth? The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. For liturgical geeks, such as myself, today is a big day in the life of the Christian church. It is Christ the King, or Reign of Christ Sunday. Think of it kind of like New Year's Eve uh, on the liturgical calendar. It's the last Sunday of the church year. Tracing our steps back, we began this year in anticipation of the coming of the Christ child. We'll do that again starting next Sunday. We celebrated his birth and his baptism. We journeyed with Jesus and the disciples through Galilee and Judea. We experienced his crucifixion and resurrection and ascension. We celebrated the beginning of the church on the day of Pentecost. And that season of Pentecost has spanned 26 Sundays, half the year, at this, to come to this high pinnacle moment. From baby Jesus to sovereign Christ. It's an interesting passage from the Gospel of John that we have for today. One would think that Christ the King Sunday might have a hefty dose of crowned jewels and pomp and circumstance. That is our orientation when it comes to royalty and kingship, after all. But there's none of that here. The passage I just read is one scene of a much lengthier trial of Jesus. He's in Jerusalem, having entered the city to a cheering crowd. At this point, he has shared the Last Supper with the disciples, and he's walked to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray, and it's there where he was arrested. And Jesus first appears before Annas, the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest, and then he's taken to Caiaphas himself for questioning, and then he's taken to Pilate's headquarters. Are you the king of the Jews? Pilate asks. Jesus answers back with a question. Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate, back to Jesus, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own people handed you over to me. What, what have you done? Jesus says, my kingdom is not from this world. If it were, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over. Pilate, so you are a king. Jesus, you say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who listens to the truth listens to my voice. To which Pilate asks, what is truth? Sound of crickets. What is truth? Biblical scholars throughout the centuries have delved into Pilate's question. Was he asking with a sarcastic or cynical tone? Or was he being sincere, maybe even with a lump in his throat? We don't know. It's hard to tell in this exchange between these two. Between, as one commentator describes him, the penniless, wandering, storyteller, imaginative Jew, 
and the hard-nosed, logical, practical, no-nonsense Roman perfunctionary. We don't know Pilate's level of sincerity, but we wouldn't, shouldn't be surprised by the subject of his question. Truth is a central theme in John's Gospel. John establishes that theme early on in the first chapter. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. And the remaining 20 chapters all serve to demonstrate the veracity of that claim. John the Baptist testifies to that truth. Jesus identifies himself to his disciples as the way, the truth, and the life. And he goes on to impart truth to them on a number of occasions throughout that gospel. Equally strong in this gospel is John's development of those who reject that truth and side with the world, as John calls it. And this morning's passage is the culmination of that theme. One writer sums it up well when he writes, in John's gospel, Jesus has enabled people to face the truth about themselves, about their relationships, their faith, and the world in which they live. And now Pilate has the possibility of recognizing the truth, and he's looking truth in the face. There, in Pilate's headquarters, the kingdom of Rome and the kingdom of God come face to face. Jesus does not deny his kingship. Rather, he redefines it. He contrasts his kingdom with the earthly kingdom of Rome. Jesus' realm is not otherworldly, it's just of a different character. If it were like the kingdom of Rome, the disciples would be fighting like Roman soldiers. And Peter had attempted to do that earlier in this same chapter when he draws his sword and cuts off the ear of a Roman soldier that's come to arrest Jesus. But Jesus tells him to put his sword back in its sheath. Rome uses violence to establish and keep power. Jesus does not do that, and he teaches his followers not to do that. Jesus neither ushers in God's kingdom nor makes followers by violence. What he does do is witness to the truth, to the truth that God is love. Proclaiming the truth, being the truth, even belonging to the truth are what make Jesus king. And Pilate asks, what is truth? Now there's a difference between fact and truth. Fact relies on a set of observations Truth, on the other hand, can't be replicated in a laboratory. It's there, whether it's seen or unseen. Fact is, you plant a seed and you harvest an ear of corn. Well, unless it's in my garden. Truth is, you reap what you sow. Both fact and truth are common terms in our language. Is that a fact, we ask? As a matter of fact, it is, we say. We face the fact, we get the facts, we check the facts, especially in an election season. In point of fact, there are the known facts, and of course, there are the facts of life. But is there a grain of truth in those facts? There's the moment of truth, if the truth be known. There's the simple truth and the unvarnished truth, if we don't bend the truth or stretch the truth. To the Romans, to the Pontius Pilate's, truth was an intellectual understanding, a factual representation of events. To the Greeks, it had to do with an accurate perspective on reality. But for John, truth is a theological concept. Even more so, truth is a relational concept that's rooted in God's own self as revealed in the person of Jesus. Noted writer Joseph Campbell was once asked, do you believe the Bible is true? Yes, he said, I do. And I believe that some of it happened. <laughs> the Bible is not altogether factual, but it is definitely altogether truthful. There's a difference. In God's kingdom, truth has to do with what one believes, yes, but it also has to do with what one does. In order to make any headway in making sense and order in the world, we have to go deeper than just an intellectual understanding. 
As one theologian puts it, in intellectual terms, we tend to think of truth in terms of reliability and dependability. In religious terms, it expands beyond this to an unwavering conformity with God's will so that we think in terms of reality and understanding. We must seek to know God and live as active witnesses on this journey into God. Jesus' life and mission is a model of this for us. In Jesus, we learn that truth is a stimulant for faithful living and witness rather than only a matter of contemplation. Truth is something we do. Truth is something we do. It's living our lives in a way that seeks to demonstrate God's grace and love. And that means living our lives in a manner strikingly different from the other empires and the other kingdoms of this world. It's a realm where the first shall be last and the last first. It's where the meek inherit the earth. It's about giving, not getting. It's where one doesn't just think about the least of these, but actually relates to and becomes one among them. It's where the king washes the feet. It's a kingdom where the strongest power is love. Earlier I made the distinction that facts, and, uh, that facts rely on a set of observations, whereas truth is there even if it can't be seen. To me, that's what this day is all about when we celebrate the reign of Christ. There's much to Christ being king that we do not see. There's that already and that not yet that we so often talk about with our faith. The fact of the matter is that we acknowledge the victory of Christ over sin and death that's already been accomplished at Easter. And while we have yet to see the full fruition of the reign of Christ, the truth is that Christ reigns even now. And that's a truth that this world desperately needs to grab hold of. The fact of the matter, this month 130 people were killed in Paris, 21 in Mali, scores more in Beirut and Baghdad. The truth is, Christ reigns. The fact of the matter, 65 countries in this world are currently involved in war, with 665 militia, guerrillas, separatist groups, drug cartels and such. The truth is, Christ reigns. The fact of the matter, last year Tennessee ranked 41st out of 50 states when it comes to child homelessness. More than 28,500 kiddos were living wherever their families could have a place to put their heads. The truth is, Christ reigns. The fact of the matter, on average, someone in this country dies by suicide every 13 minutes. The truth is, Christ reigns. The fact of the matter, nearly 47,000 gun violence incidents have been reported in the U.S. this year. 293 mass shootings. The truth is, Christ reigns. Fact of the matter, over 50 million Americans, including nearly 17 million children, are struggling with hunger, food insecurity, by definition. The truth is, Christ reigns. The fact of the matter, nearly seven and a half billion people inhabit this earth, which is straining its resources one third of those folks do not have access to clean, fresh water. The truth is, Christ reigns. The truth is, Christ reigns. And we are called to tell that truth and to be that truth. Starbucks has received a lot of attention of late because of their red cups, their plain red cups, for the holiday season. Used to be those cups were adorned with snowflakes and snowmen and such things. Some folks are up in arms because they think that's one more way of sterilizing society of Christmas. What if all of that attention shifted from the design of a cup to actually giving out cups of water to those who need it? Wouldn't that be something? Finally, in this season of 
Thanksgiving that is juxtaposed with such violence in the world, I want to share yesterday's reflections by a friend of mine named David Lamott. He writes a lot on Facebook, and this is what he wrote. When I am bombarded with that painful, violent, and scary, with all that's painful, violent, and scary, it's good to be reminded that there is also beauty, love, kindness, and courage. The existence of one does not negate the existence of the other. All of it's mixed up together, even on this side of my skin. In order to confront the former and to keep doing the work, it's good to take in and to create a whole lot of beauty. If I were getting ready to head across the desert where there would be little water, I would hydrate like crazy. And so this weekend, I'm going to nourish myself and my wife and our relationship. See y'all next week. Be kind. This week, as we gather around tables with families and friends to give thanks, let us hydrate like crazy. Let us nourish ourselves as we bask in the grace and love and generosity of our Creator who makes it all possible. And then let us proclaim the truth of that grace and that generosity, not just with our lips, but with our very lives. For that is truth. And let God's people say, Amen. Amen. to stand and declare what it is we believe. In life and in death, we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one triune God, whom alone we worship and serve. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God, Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed and blessing the children, healing the sick and binding up the brokenhearted, eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. Jesus was crucified, giving his life for the sins of the world. God raised this Jesus from the dead, breaking the power of sin and evil, and delivering us from death to life eternal. Amen. Please be seated. For our prayer time this morning, I invite us to hydrate like crazy by, by sharing what it is that we are thankful for. For what are you thankful? For your family. Amazing church family when you don't have your own nearby. <coughs> For a new day. Family and friends. Come on, let's hydrate like crazy. <laughs> Throw them out here. Our country. Someone by Children in our church. No. 
Come on, come on, come on. For those who serve our country. For those who serve our country. Jim. I'm thankful for my wife. Your wife. <laughs> and for Meg, right? <laughs> for the gorgeous world in which we live in, for November finally feeling like November. For my home. For, my home. for your home, yeah. For diversity. For grandparents. Grandparents. God's love. God's love. Yes. Memories. Memories. The freedom we're blessed with. Music. That which is true and God's love, 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 and more love. For the scriptures. Friendships. For the scriptures. For Children's Hospital. That's right. For our pastor. <laughs> For a great vet and a healthy dog. <laughs> Warm fuzzy puppy dogs and okay, okay, and cats. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Well, all right, yes, yes, yeah, we're, we're hydrating like crazy, okay, okay. Yes. 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 For the chance for Bible study and new friends. Chance for Bible study and new friends. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Grace. The ability to share. For grace. For grace, with a capital G. Yeah. For, a warm house. for a warm house on a cold day. For those deviled eggs, I'm going to eat at my mama's table <laughs> in a couple of days. For the miracles of modern medicine. For the miracles of modern medicine. Amen to that. For Jim Allen being back with us. Yeah. <laughs> For mystery. With a capital M. Yeah. Say again. For the kindness of strangers. For new friends. And old ones. Or long, t long term. Yeah, long term. <laughs> and old ones. All right. <laughs> For laughter. Even in church. Even in church. Thankful for those things that have happened in one's own life that, that help us to then be able to help others. Yeah. A lot of times that happens in trials. And, yeah. Okay, you have 10 more seconds. Come on. What's, what's there you haven't said yet? Friends who don't give up on us no matter what we do or don't. Friends who don't give up on us no matter what. For health. For health. <laughs> and pumpkin pie. <laughs> For a, yes, a refurbished fellowship hall. Right. For coffee. For coffee. <laughs> That's right. For uh, birthdays coming up. Sharif had a surprise birthday party yesterday. For music. For chocolate. <laughs> for music. For music. And music and chocolate, they go really together. <laughs> chocolate goes with anything. <laughs> for wine. <laughs> Yeah. For red and, and, and white. Okay, okay. And, and brown. And, yeah. All right. Good, good, good. I'm feeling hydrated. Huh? But,